Is it T pi pi? The wrong. I don't know. This one is the good one. This one can be directly connected to the computer. Mm -hmm. It's the next one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have notes on the side in the presenter view, or you will are you using your notes? Uh, yeah, I, it's okay like this. Hello, can you look here as well? Yes, it looks fine at the bird. Yeah, then uh, welcome everyone to another lecture on computer architecture seminar. And today we'll have Christina Morat presenting PyDRAM. And she's a second year bachelor's in computer science, I think, program. And uh, she chose to present this paper because she's particularly interested in um, computer hardware aspects of computer architecture, hardware design. And yeah, with that, I'll make a very stage to you. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I'm Christina. Today uh, I'm going to present to you PDRA, a uh, holistic end-to-end uh, FPGA-based framework for processing uh, in DRA. Okay. Here you can see the authors of the paper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the executive uh, summary. Uh, commodity DRAM based farm techniques improve performance and energy efficiency of computing system. No additional DRAM hardware loss. Uh, the problem is uh, challenges of integrating these farm techniques into a real system are not solved. Uh, general purpose computing systems, special purpose testing platforms, and system simulators can not be used to efficiently study uh, system integration challenges. And so the, the goal, so the goal is to design and implement a flexible framework that enable us to solve system integration challenges 
analyze trade-offs of end-to-end -end implementation of commodity durum based uh, of commodity durum based of techniques. And to do so, uh, our key idea is PDRUN, uh, an FPGA uh, based framework that enables uh, system integration studies and end to end evaluation of uh, one techniques using real unmodified DRAM chips. And uh, to evaluate uh, PDRUN, we use uh, one of technique. Uh, ROCLO is an in DRAM book data copy operation. And we are going to see that uh, basically PDROM can uh, speed up by almost uh, 120 uh, and more the throughput uh, of uh, normal uh, uh, CPU operation. And uh, it only uh, requires uh, uh, almost 200 lines of parallel code and uh, 560. So uh, let's see with some background. Uh, let's see how uh, DRAM is organized. And uh, basically, we have a CPU inside the CPU. We have a memory controller. Sorry. Uh, so okay, we have a CPU inside the CPU. We have the memory controller that communicates with a set of chips. Uh, through a memory channel and this is the CDR interface. And uh, each chip contains uh, several banks. Um, and <coughs> uh, uh, each bank is organized into subarrays uh, that consist of a set of forward uh, lines drivers and sets of the buyers. And uh, uh, DRAM cells are laid uh, uh, out into a two dimensional array of word lines and bit lines within a DRAM map. And uh, here you can see a uh, uh, simplified version of uh, DRAM cells. So now uh, let's look how DRAM uh, operates. Uh, this is a single uh, subarray. Here at the bottom, uh, we have uh, uh, the timeline, the timeline of uh, DRAM comments. Uh, so what we want to do now is to uh, read uh, the first uh, row, and to do so, we need to uh, activate it, and uh, uh, so wait. Um, so first we need to uh, we need to activate the first row to uh, copy uh, the cache line into the sense of the fire. And after we can uh, read from it by just performing the read operation. And uh, if we uh, want to read now the second row, we need first to close uh, uh, this row by a uh, pre charge command. And the uh, pre charge means that we set the bit lines voltage to BDT divided by two. And uh, then we do the same operation to read the, uh, the uh, second row. So to ensure correct operation, uh, we must obey certain timing parameters uh, that, uh, that we define uh, now. These. So the first one is the activation latency, called as well TRAS, basically is the interval between an activation and a bridge. And then uh, we have the pre-charge latency, called as well TRP, and uh, the access latency. Uh, so now, uh, let's talk about the uh, timing parameters. Uh, so pre works show that uh, we can violate these timings. Here are some papers. 
And uh, by doing so, we have some benefits such as uh, uh, reduced access latency, have better parallelism and uh, locality exploitation. And uh, yeah, so now let's move to uh, our techniques. So basically, uh, pump techniques take advantage of uh, operational principle of memory to perform both data movement and computation uh, in memory. It can uh, exploit internal connectivity to move data and can exploit analog computation capability. Uh, here, if you're interested, you can check this lecture on processing using memory. Uh, and so now we have. Uh, uh, if I show you some uh, prior works. We divided them in two categories. So the first one uh, had great potential to improve system performance and energy efficiency, such as uh, Pluto, Proton, and BodyRAM. The second provide low cost secu security primitives. Um, yeah, and such as the uh, free lab book. Uh, D-range uh, of TRNG, and on the paper they show these two case study. They implement actually these two pump techniques, but we are just going to see row clone. So the key idea of row clone um, is that we want to copy the source row to the destination row uh, with not using the, uh, the CPU. And so for doing so, uh, we uh, first uh, basically copy the source uh, row to the buffer, and then we're going to move uh, the data uh, from the sense amplifier to the destination row. And uh, so uh, today's theorem uh, already scored the first step. And now I'll show you how we can do the same. Uh, basically, the key idea is to use crafted uh, timings. Uh, so we want to uh, reduce the timing of uh, uh, this common sequence, act, pre, act. And uh, we're going to use the timing that uh, uh, they use in uh, compute DRAM papers because they already demonstrate in DRAM copy operation in real DDR3 chips. And uh, basically, here is uh, uh, how standard the DRAM timings work. Uh, you have you activate row S, then you recharge it, and then you activate row D. What we want to do here with violating the DRAM timings is to uh, basically activate row S, wait for 10 nanoseconds, then uh, uh, recharge it, and after activating uh, row D. And basically, we want that this activation uh, take effect before actually the recharge uh, take effect so that we can copy. Is it clear? No? Should I draw something so you can understand it? Yes. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So now let's move uh, to PDRAM um, and let's have an overview. So basically, we want to have an application uh, to perform uh, book data initialization. We have uh, our device, I understand the key idea. And uh, to do so, we need to provide uh, support for custom timing parameters, uh, a control logic for palm operation, a software interface to execute palm operations, and a supervisor for basic system support. And uh, we'll bridge uh, this the system gap with customizable hardware and software components. Uh, and in doing so, we allow the user to rapidly implement pump techniques, solve system integration challenges, analyze end-to-end -end implementation. So basically, uh, we have four key components, two for the hardware, uh, two for the software. 
um, for the hardware we have uh, the thumb operation controller, the PD run memory controller. For the software, we have a uh, thumb operation library and a custom supervisor software. So now let's uh, see how actually the hardware software components look like. So here we have POC. Basically, POC decode and execute DRAM uh, uh, instruction. Uh, it, uh, it is connected uh, to the hardware system as a memory map model, uh, meaning it uh, recites the PDRAM instruction over the memory bus. And uh, basically, we I can change and solve this. Okay, so now we have these uh, three registers uh, that are ac accessible uh, via the memory bus. And uh, this makes it um, easy to port uh, POC to another system uh, that uses different CPUs, ISAs. And then POC communicates uh, with the memory controller um, over a simple interface. And uh, basically, it's uh, he sends a request for a POM operation, he waits until it is completed, and then he's going to read its result. Now let's move uh, to the second uh, hardware component, uh, the custom memory controller, uh, that basically performs POM operation uh, with the, by violating uh, the timing parameters. And uh, here we have the common scheduler, support conventional, uh, memory operations such as load and uh, store. Uh, and uh, it uh, implements one state machine uh, to support new, oh, to control, okay, it implements one uh, state machine uh, to control the execution uh, of the operation, of the memory operation. And uh, this uh, makes the DRAM memory control controller easy to extend uh, and to support new operation by just uh, replicating the state machine. And then we have the physical interface that uh, basically controls the physical DDR3 interface. Uh, and then it receives uh, commands from the command scheduler and operates DDR3 bits. Then we have uh, Pumalib. Uh, basically, Pumalib uh, contains a customizable function that interface uh, with the uh, uh, POC. And uh, basically, uh, for doing so, we just like execute some load and store uh, instruction. Uh, yeah, and uh, here are some uh, functions that uh, PTR already implemented in Homoly. Uh, we're gonna after see uh, this one completely wrong. And then we have the custom supervisor software, uh, and uh, this exposes the uh, problem uh, operation to the user application via system calls, and it implements the necessary OS primitives uh, and. Uh, the necessary function and data structure. So we're recapping a little bit. Custom supervisor software only are the software components, and the POC and the memory controller are the hardware components. Uh, so now let's see an execution of the uh, POM operation. And as I said before, we're going to perform uh, a copy row. 
And uh, so first, the user make a, a system call to the copy row function. Afterwards, uh, the custom supervisor software uh, uh, is going to find the, the physical addresses of uh, these two operands and then call the copy function uh, with this semantics to implement. So basically, it's copy row SD. S is for the, is the address of the source. And D is the address of the destination. Uh, third step, uh, basically, copy row execute two store instruction in the CPU. Uh, the first one uh, store and update the instruction register with copy row. And the second one uh, uh, set the start flag to logical one. Uh, and uh, this initializes the problem operation. So, uh, when the start uh, flag is set, then uh, POC um, tells the memory controller to perform uh, a row flow. And uh, when the memory uh, controller Acknowledge uh, this uh, request. It will uh, the block will set the start to logical zero and the act flag to logical one. And to finishing uh, executing the operation, the memory controller issued comments with violating timing parameters to the DDR3 models. Uh, after it, when it finished executing the operation, um, uh, the, the memory controller will set yeah, uh, will set the fin flag to logical one, and uh, the copy row periodically checks either act or fin flex uh, using load instruction. And this is because there are like some function that can uh, uh, they can finish before the fin flag is set to one. So it's depending on the, the function. In this case, it will return when the fin flag is set to logical one. And uh, in this example, we didn't see uh, we didn't use the data register because uh, uh, the operation is stored in memory. But the data register is used to read the random uh, numbers in a generated by D range. And here we have the, uh, the prototype. Uh, so basically, here we have uh, uh, this FPGA, CDZZC706. Uh, under this cage, we have the DRAM model, and uh, uh, we have a RISC five system. So PDRAM is free; it's a free open source software. You can uh, find it on the GitHub repository if you're interested. Yeah, let's move to the case in one. Do you have questions to now? So uh, basically for integrating row clone, like row clone has like data mapping and alignment uh, requirements that cannot be satisfied by current memory allocation mechanism. And the first uh, requirement is alignment. So basically the operands must uh, be placed at the same offset. Uh, and this uh, is because uh, they need to share the same sense of the fire, else you cannot uh, uh, copy it, uh, source it to the target. Then uh, we have uh, granularity, so operands must copy the whole theorem rows. 
This is because uh, we can may overwrite data if uh, it's not the normal. And the third is the mapping. Uh, so basically, the operands must uh, uh, must uh, be placed uh, in the same uh, summary. And uh, because uh, uh, we can only perform copy inside the same theorem summary. And uh, this case satisfies all three uh, uh, requirements. So let's do a simple observation. Um, today's system usually has two layers of translation. Um, and uh, the OS has full control over the virtual address, the physical address translation. It don't have the control over the physical address to the DRM address thing. So uh, basically, the idea is that if we can control this part and we know uh, these mappings, then we can implement a function. Which function? This one, a lock line. Basically, a lock line take. Uh, uh, to uh, integer arguments, one is the uh, size, so the number of bytes you want to allocate, and one is uh, the identifier. That basically, if you want to allocate array A and array B in the same uh, subarray, you just uh, put the, the same ID. And uh, basically, uh, a lock line works like this. Uh, it first uh, uh, try to uh, distribute uh, the array over multiple bands by occupying row as full as possible. And uh, it will just fall back to malloc for the remaining data. And if the size uh, exceeds the available physical memory, it will just cause an exception. So let's have here an overview uh, of how it's working. Basically, here we want to uh, allocate uh, two arrays, uh, A and B, and each is the 16 kilobytes uh, large. So here we see we divide it in uh, four chunks because uh, the virtual uh, page size is four kilobytes. Here we have several bands and uh, two rows, and these are in the same uh, um, uh, summary. And what, uh, what a local line uh, try to do uh, okay. is it that it will scatter contiguous virtual pages uh, into multiple bands uh, to enhance bank level parallelism, and it make uh, sure that uh, two arrays uh, can be copied to each other. Um, okay. Another problem is memory coherence. Basically, row clock operates uh, in uh, DRAM. Uh, so, up, uh, up to date data may be in cache. So, this causes a coherency problem. And uh, to solve it, uh, we implement CL flush in a RISC 5 rocket. And basically, the CL flush instructor um, uh, flush the dirty cache block to uh, the, the theorem uh, to ensure that row clone operates uh, on up to date data. And here are some props. Uh, it's realistic because it's supporting in a contemporary architecture. Um, such as x86 and AMD, if I'm not wrong. And uh, it reads, reads and writes can uh, it in the cache, flush um, cache lines for your interior operations. And then uh, a disadvantage is that instruction, the instruction overhead, because we have one instruction for cache block. Uh, and uh, so this may result in a performance impact, especially if frequent cache flushes are uh, required. 
let's move now to the evaluation uh, uh, methodology. So basically, we evaluate the performance of row clone operation with the system support. Uh, here, there is a table that shows um, the configuration of PDRAM. We have uh, five megahertz CPU uh, going to work at five megahertz, and uh, it uses a pipeline in, in order rocket core, which is a small L1 uh, data cache. And uh, we have one gigabyte of DDR3 that uh, runs at uh, 800 uh, megatransfer per second. Basically, we're going to test two configuration, bare metal, uh, that uh, uh, basically bare metal uh, don't use any uh, address translation. So uh, it's going to just uh, um, perform a row copy, uh, row clone operation with uh, physical addresses. And then uh, uh, the second one is no flush. Uh, basically, it has OS support, such as virtual memory, long line. And we assume that data is uh, always up to date uh, here. So we don't use uh, CL flush in uh, both configuration. Okay. And here, just uh, for a reminder, we uh, this is our violating the timing. So T Rust, we're going to put it to 10 nanoseconds, TRP as well to 10 nanoseconds. Uh, so we have two programs, uh, copy and edit. Copy copies n byte array to another n byte array. And then we have uh, init that initialize, initialize n byte array to all zeros. And then uh, each program has two versions, uh, the CPU copy version, basically it uses uh, memory loading stores instruction, and then the row clone uh, version that basically uses for clone operation. So um, let's see the, this plot. So basically uh, here we have uh, uh, we show the throughput improvement provided by row clone operation over the CPU operation. In the X axis, we have the array size, and uh, you can see it's uh, always increasing. And uh, the bar, the gray one is for the row clone copy, and the red one is for row clone initialize. So the first uh, observation is that uh, uh, we have a significant improvement over traditional uh, CPU operation. We see the throughput uh, from uh, RCC improvement. It's uh, almost 320 times larger than the CPU for eight kilobytes uh, array size. And here for eight uh, megabytes array size. And then for RCE, we see as well uh, that it increased by a lot the, the throughput. And the second observation is that uh, uh, as the array size increases, the throughput as well increases. Uh, but we reach actually a situation point at uh, one megabyte. Uh, Let's see now the no flush basically is the same uh, setup to put improvement, uh, the array size, and the same power for the local. And the first observation is that uh, RCC improves the uh, copy throughput by uh, almost 59 uh, times more than uh, uh, the CPU operation. And here, uh, for eight kilobytes and uh, uh, almost 119 for eight uh, megabytes. As well, uh, RCI is as well improving by a lot. Uh, uh, the, uh, the throughput, yeah. So uh, we see that the execution time of uh, RCC and RCI operations is not increased linearly, 
in here. And let's go to see a flush overhead. Uh, basically, here we had always the throughput improvement. Uh, and uh, here we have the fraction of dirty cash flux. Uh, and we uh, perform uh, uh, the operation in a eight, eight megabyte uh, arrays. Uh, so the first observation, if we assume that 50% 30 uh, cash flow, uh, we have uh, for row clone copy 3.2 higher throughput over CPU copy, and for RCI we had 3.9. Uh, higher throughput over uh, CPU initialization. Observation two is that I mean, you can see as the fraction of uh, the dirty cash flows increase, uh, the throughput improvement uh, uh, will decrease actually. Yeah. You can see. So, um, TL flash operation are inefficient, supporting coherence for row clone, and uh, we expect that uh, the throughput uh, will increase as the coherence between the CPU cache and the linear acceleration improves. Uh, let's do the conclusion. Basically, the motivation was to. Uh, Commodity zero based work techniques for performance and energy efficiency with no additional zero hybrid costs. This one we showed it. Uh, the challenges of uh, integrating these pump techniques into a real system are not solved. And then we want to design a, uh, and implement a flexible framework, and basically we do it with PDRA. Um, yeah, and we are um, going to get this working. And do you have any questions? Yes. Um, on slide 42, um, on the figure, um, one can see a um, considerably better Google's improvement for row code configuration than for row code in Schwarzenberg. Um, like it's almost a uh, double as high as the storage for the initialization operation. Um, what spot loss of the reasons? Um, so, uh, basically, this is the because we didn't see how actually a lot of time works. Uh, like because we have some data structure and uh, we are going to access them and basically it is because uh, in row clone and if I'm not I'm wrong you have two operands and you need to check uh, uh, their physical addresses so you need to, to enter the uh, page the physical page table Twice, and uh, obviously, uh, it, it has just one offering. Yeah, sounds Hey, yeah. Um, we kind of like decreased our GitLab size, so they won't just randomly delete it. Yeah, too big. Because our group is too big. Yeah, someone will like ask you. Of course, it's logical that if you have a group with like 23 people in it, then it has the same size storage limits as like a project. That I don't understand. Uh, how should I? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe someone can do that. I don't think so. 
Okay. So I'm going to just keep going. All of the work now. Yeah, thank you. So the strength, uh, PDRM is uh, flexible uh, because uh, we can uh, extend it uh, to study uh, other pump techniques. Uh, it provides uh, hardware and software components. Uh, so, um, and they illustrate actually the capabilities of this prototype. This is another strength. And then uh, another one is that uh, since PDRM uh, is uh, an open source and it's uh, available uh, to the public, uh, researcher community can uh, uh, develop uh, uh, the framework or uh, research in a or try to study them. And last, it, it is actually a well-written paper. So if you want to actually read it, it's really fluent. You can understand a really good uh, thing. And here there is a, a motivation actually for the flexible because they compare different uh, prototype. And uh, you can see that PDRM satisfies like all of these uh, uh, requirements and order not making. So, yeah. The weaknesses is that uh, the memory allocation uh, mechanism limits uh, the amount of data you can allocate in the same summary. So, this is a limit. And then uh, the Actually, PDRM is not so easy to extend. Uh, but we're going to discuss actually these two points in the discussion. So that's it. And then, uh, third one, because I wanted to find one, is the lack of information about the underlying structure of IRT. So basically, uh, they, uh, we have three data structure, and uh, for uh, two of them, they provide like how actually is the data structure and not just how it's working. And then IRT is just saying how it's working and it's like confusing. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's start with this first uh, discussion point, PIM versus PUM. And this is because I was getting a little bit confused at the certain point. So, uh, so do you know the, the difference or what, what do you think? Maybe you already know. And if there are differences, maybe you are the same thing. Okay, so let's give some definition. Uh, so processing using memory enable operation within uh, main memory with minimal changes. Processing in near memory, someone has an idea? Yes. I think processing in memory is brings the computation units uh, as close as possible to the memory. <laughs> Uh, prevent or maybe mitigate this um, days on the sort of bottleneck of having shorter costs in the computation units and the minimum units. Super good. So basically, uh, processing using memory and processing near memory for PIM. So processing in memory. And we have uh, two examples. The first one is uh, a bit, and the second one is spring filter. Uh, I think you already heard of it. And uh, if you're interested, actually, you can uh, check so this paper. They talk about uh, um, PIM techniques, and they give some definition of 
processing using memory and processing your memory, and some examples as well. So now the question is, where will you this PD run? Yes. Uh, the intersection between PM and PUM. Like Here. Yes. Okay. Someone else? Does it actually, does um, EDRAM involve in memory for some item? Because otherwise, I think it would be. Um, Mere processing using memory. Okay. Well, basically, for me as well, till now, it's uh, processing using memory, but it can be uh, processing <laughs> in memory. And here, what they say uh, in the paper is PDRAM can be easily extended with a programmable microprocessor placed near the memory controller such system. Integration challenges of processing near memory. So, for me, as well, it's more about the PIM, but it can be as well PIM if you expand the site. So, here uh, I will introduce you some concepts before uh, we discuss the second one. Uh, so, basically, this is, this is a data structure that uh, is implemented in the CSS. And, uh, Basically, we uh, uh, we have this sum table uh, that is uh, indexed uh, with the uh, uh, back and the subarrays, and basically it keep track of uh, uh, like where the DRAM uh, rows are placed. So we want to have for each entry, we have we want to have the the uh, the, the rows that are in the same subarray in the same bank. And uh, this is because if we want to call a local line, we want to uh, have the physical address that point to a DRM row in summary zero. And then we want to update the, uh, the table, uh, the page table, so we know where it's the data. Uh, and then we have this other one as uh, the allocation ID table. Uh, it's in this indexed by the IDs. And so basically the ID entry uh, are the are the are pointers to uh, uh, some of the entry. But don't worry if you didn't understand how I'll show you um, how it's working so maybe it's better. So basically here we have a DRAM, we have two bags, two subarrays, and these are the entries of a, a, a sum table. So each subarray uh, for each bag, uh, as you can see it here. So now let's assume that these green uh, rows are uh, three. This is how the sum table will look like. So you can uh, store, you have uh, all the rows, and here you have actually a pointer that points to the uh, rows that are free. And here, no, because there are no free rows. So let's assume that we did uh, our local line, we call a local line function to allocate array A. Uh, and we and it's placed it here. Uh, and we want to allocate uh, B in uh, in the same uh, summary. So what it's going to do, basically, a log line is going to go to the IT table. It's going to read uh, what's inside ID zero, and basically ID zero points to this. Some table, so then we can place uh, our B into row seven. Is it clear? I would say working. Yes. So yeah, here is uh, the whole picture of how it's going. 
So what I want you to think about is let's think, uh, let's assume that we have 32 kilobytes um, of a submarine, like a single submarine contains only 32 kilobytes, and we want to allocate it to arrays uh, with the size uh, 32 kilobytes. So in total, we have 64 kilobytes. So the problem is that what if we need to allocate more data than what we can store in a submarine? Like how we can do it? Because just only one uh, array on the end just deals the whole submarine. So do you have any uh, ideas? The computation cannot be performed on different salaries in Uh No, not with the... Uh... Oh, no, wait. We brought how? Uh, I mean, it's not feasible as a different due to the restriction that the computer structure goes to what process maybe half of the uh, operation in one sub of the other But I think you said that it's not possible. No, no, no. no. Uh, yeah, but the, this is the, actually about the idea I came with. Uh, it's the same one. Uh, so basically, if we want to allocate these two arrays, here we have a our DRAM and the two subarrays. And basically, what we are going to do is uh, just dividing uh, by two the, the size of these two arrays. So we can place them uh, into different uh, subarrays. And uh, so, basically, when we're doing so, uh, we want to allocate, when we want to allocate some arrays, uh, we can check if uh, the size of the subarray divided by two is equal to the size of the uh, array. And uh, if it's yes, uh, we can continue the normal alkaline. Else, uh, we divide it into chunk until we can split it. And this is going to be handled by the alkaline. And then the IT rules dynamically, different IDs can share. Uh, same sound entries, yeah. Just, 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 just. Um, okay. So in PDA, the CPU uh, operates at uh, 50 megahertz, while the DRAM model is clocked at 400 megahertz. What is the problem? And here, if we can have a hint. Or do you see a problem? Maybe there is no problem. I think, but this rather sort of general problem that um, access times to or times that are needed to access data uh, are vertically higher than the time of processing things to uh, perform computation. Because, yeah, sometimes. Um, 100 times more than the specific something. Yes. This is our realistic uh, in the morning. Uh, in uh, our here, usually the, the memory is much slower. So we can see here. Usually, uh, the CPU range from 2 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz. And usually, common uh, memory is DDR4, which range to this 2. And so the memory is too faster than the CPU. And basically, uh, the evaluation of uh, what they've done on PDR are optimistic. Is correct because we're going to continue with this. Yes. Is it actually plausible? I don't know if that's possible. 
in video, everything is flexible. Yeah. No, actually, um, not in real system, but here the prototype is the the disk. But it's working. How? That's a good question. I don't know. Someone else here? Something, nothing. We're going to continue. With basically, we have here memory controller clock frequency and a CPU clock frequency. So, how can we solve this problem? Like, you can see the clock frequency of the CPU like, takes such. And then the memory. Yes. Uh, why is this problem? Like we want to um we want to uh, make uh, the system more realistic. So we want either to slow down the memory clock or to uh, faster the CPU clock. But actually, the memory clock we cannot uh, uh, slow as so it down more because and uh, now we're to type like minimum is this one. So if you have ideas on I don't know how you can do it. And like still solve the cycles, make it slower. The memory control. Okay. Can work. I don't know, I'm going to propose some solution and then uh, I just want to hear you guys. So basically what I thought is when the CPU wants to do a rest to the memory, we're going to hold it for X cycles. So in the so it's going to think that uh, the memory uh, uh, has a lower latency. And for doing so, basically, what I thought it was like, when you fetch, you fetch the stage, uh, and uh, basically, uh, you hold the program counter for X cycles, so it's not continue. And then you're going to decode the stage and you're going to continue of uh, the decode execute the, the other stages. So just hold the request of the CPU and wait X cycles. Another solution that I thought was basically we have some data in the memory and let's just uh, let uh, data pass through all this register, so it's going to slow down the actually coming. Yeah. We didn't use any of these ideas, and we the manual for actually This is just to temporarily store the data until they can be delivered to this. And now, do you have other ideas to how to do it better than what? No. Okay. Okay, let's move to discussion 24. So, basically, uh, the infrastructure is not so easy to expand uh, because it has uh, hardware dependencies and memory controller modification. You need to like to. If you want to uh, change basically, I don't know, the rocket ship to another system, it's like you need to do a lot of stuff for uh, integrating this. So it's not that easy. And uh, what I want you uh, to think of just a little bit, uh, I didn't came out with the solution, so maybe I'm gonna just say to, to you. So what I thought is like make, making a PDR structure more configurable and uh, 
parameters are good. So uh, including the option for different memory technologies, timing parameters, and uh, stuff like that. But this is not a solution. Uh, the infrastructure will still be difficult to extend, but I didn't actually came with a solution. So maybe you have something everything rebuilt from zero and we have one solution. Yes. Might be possible to employ some kind of um, artificial intelligence like you develop uh, intelligent memory controls or intelligent software that can adapt to different situations different other uh, as we have uh, the people who talk at the beginning of the semester developing more intelligent um, memories that can learn from data that can make use of the massive amount of data that's available to them um, to go like that and come up with, come up with uh, um, better, better decision making policies uh, over time. But I don't know, I think in this architecture, you know, it, it does not an AI way. Um, no, but maybe they can implement it. Yes. Well, uh, so this uh, might be good, but it sounds too high level to me. Uh, do you maybe want to discuss it more in that? Like, how would the AI help with the extensible? Um, where exactly do you apply the model and so on? Um, could be good, but uh, basically, I don't know what they are. Yeah. I think this would require a deeper look into um, software that was used to be like. Nothing. Ideas. Okay. So uh, a lot of slides I took it from uh, uh, this talk of uh, the has done by Anna Berg, uh, and as well this one. I actually took as well some slides about D range. You can actually check this video because they didn't uh, speak about gearing, but it's really an interesting topic. You can see either the backup slides or watching this video. Uh, it's not <coughs> and I want to thank you, my mentors, uh, Misa and Mark. Uh, questions about anything? Comments or everything. Oh, but I'll leave the other day. Maybe I'll make the comments while the people are we don't have a lot of time. We don't have the problem with it, so we can put it any more of it. Yeah, they can give away detail for them. I think uh, the flexibility of the infrastructure is a problem. I don't know how I can agree with some of the comments you made, but. Uh, yeah. I think the flexibility yeah. is the whole story. So can I get them up to us to be joined? Nice. The way you find it is mostly the yeah. uh, constraints of the memory control which is designed and we say, okay, the memory control is flexible. Okay. So you can add uh, a new person uh, to the phone that operates uh, in a similar way. Uh, can you hear me? But then there's an extensibility aspect of the community. Are you uh, talking to me? Yes, my uh, Can you make yes. uh, Elias the co host, yeah. please? Yes. No, I was Elias. Mohamed, I didn't answer. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh... Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're waiting a moment. It was good that you were trying to engage people because there's more people engaged in discussion. So a good thing. Thank you. Yeah, they can they can share their screen. Okay. Elias, yeah. can you try to share your screen? Uh, the, the diagram. Yes. And Does uh, it work? It yes. Be something else. Okay. So the way the image is actually is actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the terminology is a mess. That's yeah. the way we embed them. It's really trusting in memory and compatibility. Then it's a different way to implement both. Clearly, the idea of evaluating yeah. the front of using the application, the infrastructure for evaluating the front. Do the that. But it could be extended for a buzzing near memory and actually put a stop on. Can you hear me in the lecture hall? Yes, you yes, can hear me. I'll uh, introduce you first and then you can start the talk. Yes. Can you speak again? Uh, Hello, you... can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, so, present is uh, Elias uh, von Daniken. Uh, he's a second year, sorry, he's studying master's in electrical engineering and he's in the second to last semester. And the uh, uh, focus of study is in embedded systems, but he's also interested in computer architecture. Unfortunately, he's not uh, here uh, presenting in person today because he's unwell. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll hear from Elias now. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I welcome you to my presentation. I will present Flash Cosmos um, in Flash bulk bitwise operation using inherent cap computation capability of NAND Flash memory. The paper was presented at uh, Micro 22. Uh, here is my executive summary. Summary: We're dealing again, as in the last um, presentation, uh, with the data movement. Data movement uh, is an energy bottleneck and an efficiency bottleneck. And the difference uh, to the last presentation is that today I will be talking about um, in-flash processing. Um, the key idea is to be able to um, sense multiple word lines together to use that as a bulk bitwise operation. Also, to make uh, the flash chips more reliable, uh, um, enhanced SLC mode programming uh, will be introduced. First, I will be talking about the paper summary, and then at the end, I will discuss the paper with you guys. Let's start with the motivation. As you probably all know, uh, bulk, bulk bitwise operations are uh, quite used in different applications like uh, genome analysis we have seen in, the, in at the beginning of the seminar, or I'm not sure if any of you already have taken cryptography classes. Usually there you have some pseudo random function and then all the data get, gets XORed with that pseudo random string. So there are a lot of these bulk bitwise operations used. Yes. Um, to get the bigger picture, here we have a normal memory hierarchy. We have some storage, we have main memory, and we have the CPU with its caches and GPU. And right now, these systems. Um, 
are bottlenecked by the bandwidth of, bit of their buses. Between main memory and CPU, we have around 40 gigs. And between storage and main memory, we can achieve around 8 gigabytes. Um, these conventional systems are, for this talk, are called outside storage processing. So we get them, the term, terminology right. So data movement significantly bottlenecks performance and energy efficiency in these OSP systems. So to kind of uh, mitigate these problems, there are multiple different approaches. As we have seen in the last talk, we, we could do uh, in DRAM processing. and But for this talk, our focus is on kind of data sets that do not fit into normal main memory. Like the data is in the storage. Yes, and we will be mainly be talking about uh, in uh, on talking about flash based storage. Yes, here the same picture from before, but now we can see uh, in the storage, there are in storage computing units so, such that only the results have to be transferred through the bus hierarchy. This, this mitigates the data movement overhead uh, significantly. Uh, let's get back to the same picture. The problem is now that the bottleneck isn't the bus hierarchy uh, from storage to main memory to the CPU. It's inside the storage from the separate NAND chips to the in storage computing units. Um, so to state that clear, SSD internal bandwidth becomes the new bottleneck in, in storage processing. To mitigate even that bottleneck, we use a thing called in flash processing. So we only transfer transport from the NAND chips the results to the in storage computing units. This is called in flash processing. So we have three things: we have outside storage processing, in store storage processing, and in flash processing. The three different things. So in flash processing fundamentally mitigates the data movement because only results are transferred, never data itself. Uh, now let's let's have a look at uh, such a NAND chip. These NAND chips uh, consist of multiple pages and these pages are then uh, connected to a page buffer. And such a page, page buffer can load and store pages. Uh, now we have to talk a bit about uh, the state of the art in flash processing techniques and how they do perform their bulk bitwise operations. First, in every page, there's a single operand. And then with a sensing operation, such an operand is loaded into the page buffer. And now the trick is while keeping the operand into the page buffer and uh, cleverly controlling the latching circuit, you can load a second operand such that they form an end operation. And now you can do that multiple times sequentially. Such that you can accumulate your result into the page buffer. And then you only have to write out the result. So the state of the art uh, paper is called Parabit. It significantly reduces the data movement outside of these flash chips. But the serial sensing operations, so for each operand we have to do a sensing operations, that kind of bottlenecks the Parabit. Now, there is another issue with in-flash processing. And then, for example, we have here the same picture as before. But as you probably know, 
like memory or flash chips, they're not completely reliable. They have some errors in them. And so if you do the sensing operations, the errors are getting accumulated into, uh, into the page buffer. This uh, means that the applicability of Parabit is limited to really um, highly error tolerant applications. So now let's just discuss the goals of Flash Cosmos. Uh, Flash Cosmos wants to address the new bottleneck of in-flash processing, the serial sensing oper operations, and it wants to make in-flash processing reliable, such that it provides accurate computation results and applicability is not just uh, confined to these uh, special type of op applications. Now, their idea is to, instead of sequentially reading the operands with one sensing operations, read all the operands simultaneously. And you can see it here because the errors don't exist anymore. They want to uh, eliminate these raw bit errors by uh, a thing called ESP, which I will um, explain later. So now I'm done with the motivations. I will continue with the background. Uh, to really understand what um, Flash Cosmos is about, you have to know how a flash memory kind of works. And we will start with the, the single most uh, small thing, the flash cell. A flash cell is like a memory cell. And it can be either programmed or uh, erased. When it's erased, it, it has a one in it. and when it's programmed, it's, 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 it's zero. And you have to think of it like um, when, when it's erased, it acts like a resistor. And when it's uh, programmed, it, it's an open switch. If you're into electronics, you can imagine it's, it's a special type of transistor with some additional features. So, Multiples of these cells are then kind of tucked together into a string. They're serially, collect, serially connected and then attached to the bit line. So if we want to read one of these cells, we kind of overdrive or over, um, we, we set the threshold voltage for these non-target cells such that they are always conducting. And then we kind of um, read the current onto the bit line. And if it's a one, it's conducting. So the current, oh, and here is the other uh, case where it's a zero. So it's, it's an open switch. So if the, the current can be drained through the NAND string, we know there, there was a one in the flash cell. And if it can't, it, we know it, it was a zero. Now, as you probably have guessed, for a full flash memory, we put a lot of these strings together into blocks. So now a, a block is like a two dimensional array. We can either uh, turn on word lines and then sensing the bit lines. And to note here is that like these word lines are really huge. So they have a quite a big uh, bit level parallelism. And then multiples of these blocks are put together into um, a full flash chip. Now let's focus on one of these NAND strings inside the whole system. Uh, as I said, they are uh, kind of serially connected. And now I, I told you that the flash cells are kind of some weird transistor. And as you can see on the picture, it's, it's the same as an end gate, just a bit bigger. And if we then have a look at multiple of these strings connected to the same bit line, 
they have like have the similar structure than OR gates. So that's really important that you get that. Or is it unclear to anyone? Since I'm not in the room, you have to speak up so I can hear you. Okay, I, I, I assume it's clear. So to repeat, we use the serial connection of flash cells as an end gate, and we use the parallel connections of multiple bit strings onto a bit line, uh, NAND strings onto a bit line as an OR gate. So that was the background. Now let's talk about uh, Flash Cosmos. And now the key idea are we use multiple word line sensing to enable in Flash bulk bitwise operations. And we will be using these enhanced SLC mode programming to eliminate these raw bit errors. First, let's focus on MVS. Uh, as I told you, now we're talking about the AND gate. These NAND strings have an inherent, are inherently serially connected. So if we want to have an AND gate between two operands, for example, we, we, we turn on conducting for the non-target cells so we don't care about them. And then here you can see it, it's programmed in a way so all of the cases for the end gate are represented here um, in the target cells. And now you, you, you can see that if only both of the cells have a one in them, then the bit line will sense a one. Otherwise, it will be a zero. This is equivalent to an AND gate. So Flash Cosmos can do bitwise AND of multiple pages in the same block with only one sensing operations. Now let's talk about the OR gate. We have a word line in block one and a word line in, in block I. And we, we want to uh, bitwise OR of these word lines. You can't see it here, but all the, the of the other cells are non in these blocks are non-target cells and they will be conducting such that if we now sense the currents, if only one of the bits in the word lines is, is conducting, then it will be uh, read as a one. And this is equivalent to an OR gate. So if only both of the operands act as open switches, it's zero. So Flash Cosmos enables these bitwise or operations of multiple pages in different blocks with only one sensing operation. Uh, now let's shortly talk about this enhanced SLC mode. Um, is, is it to anyone clear what SLC means? or uh, multiple levels, multi-level cells or triple level cells for an end flash. Um, yeah, since I can't hear any, anything from you, I assume it's, it's clear. Uh, so here we have a picture of um, some statistics of a flash cell. Um, or the number of cells is on the y-axis and uh, the, the voltage is on the x-axis. So if we have programmed cells, they will be around here. And if we have erased cells, they will be around here. So you, you can think of these as distributions. And this system is kind of really prone to errors. In normal uh, flash cells, there is usually data randomization used in ECC to kind of mitigate these problems. But ESP kind of further increases this voltage margin. So here we you can see the new distribution of programmed cells. And you can see it's, it's further away from the erased cells. 
and this is perf performed with some as uh, some commands you can issue to the flash cells uh, flash chips and it, it's called incremental step pulse programming to kind of move this hump further up but as you can probably guess from the name, incremental step pulse programming. If I, if I want to move the, the hump more up, I have to do more incremental step pulses. So it, it kind of in, um, increases the latency of, of the programming cells. Yes. Uh, so ESP enables in flash enables real, reliable in-flash computation by trading storage density and programming latency. And quite important is that the storage and uh, latency overheads only affect data used for in-flash computation. You can have in a flash device, you can have multiple chips and some of them are kind of in, in Flash Cosmos enabled and some are not, and you can mix and match there. So let's talk about uh, a bit about the evaluation they've done in the paper. Uh, their methodology, they did a, quite an extensive real device characterizations to uh, validate the uh, feasibility and real, uh, reliability of Flash Cosmos. Uh, they tested 160 uh, TLC NAND chips Yes, and kind of important to know, they, they tested everything under worst case operation conditions. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, flash chips or flash cells have also retention times like T DRAM time, uh, DRAM cells, but it's, it's way bigger. It's here, they assumed it's a, a one year retention time and they have already done uh, 10K program and erase, erase cycles on the cells. Uh, these programming and erase cycles are kind of a metric on how old a chip is and how much worn and tear is done to a chip. Yes, and they used uh, worst case data patterns. Uh, yeah. Now to the system evaluation. They used a state of the art SSD simulator, they used a free uh, real-world applications, uh, bitmap indices used commonly in databases, and image segmentations and uh, k-clickstar listing. Um, these clickstar things, I don't know if you have taken a class from Professor Wattenhofer, but there he will explain you how these, he's the guy for that stuff. Uh, anyway, um, then for their baseline, they used an Outside storage processing system, like a common system with an Intel i7, they used an uh, in storage processing system to compare against, and they compared against Parabit, that state of the art in flash processing mechanism. Uh, the results from that real device uh, characterization both inter and intra block multi word line sensing operations uh, require no real changes to the cells and the structure of the NAND. Uh, chip. Both of these MVS operations can activate multiple word lines with only a small uh, increase in sensing latency. And e ESP significantly improves the reliability of computation results. Now, uh, let's talk a bit about the performance and the energy efficiency of the um, Flash Cosmos. Here on the left, you can see they can, for bitmap indices, they can achieve a, an improvement of up to 150x. And on average, it's a 25x speed up over outside storage processing uh, techniques. Interesting to see is for uh, image segmentation, um, even though there are a lot of uh, bit, bulk bitwise operations used, the amount of operands isn't that big. So Parabit is, isn't limited by its se sequential sensing. So they're, so they're on par. And for the energy, you can kind of observe the same pattern. Image segmentation is kind of on par for Parabit and Flash Cosmos. And 
for the other ones uh, for bitmap indices and click star k click star it's um yeah better and energy savings are up to 13x so let's sum up the my uh, presentation of the paper um first uh, it's, it's a novel work who enables this multi-operand bulk bitwise operations and is highly reliable. It improves performance by up to 32x over uh, OSP and improves energy efficiency by up to 95x. And it's, what is really neat, it's, it doesn't require changes to the flash cell structure. Now I'm done with the paper. Uh, now let's talk about my analysis and then have a little discussion. Uh, the strengths, I think the, the work is quite novel. I think it's a really smart usage of these pre-existing flash structure. They looked at it and then it's kind of really understood how it behaves and how that could be used to do computation and then i'm i'm not really super deep into computer architecture but after reading that paper i kind of got the feeling that it's this flash cosmos has the potential to make in flash processing somewhat feasible so even though i probably won't be working in a computer architecture, I will kind of put it on my backlog that in flash processing could be a thing for the future. And then another uh, strength I think is, is important to mention is like in flash processing is uh, data centering as, as its maximum. Like for databases, the data is in the storage. It's not in main memory or in some caches. It's in storage. So we want to do the computation where the data resides. Also, uh, what I liked is uh, about Flash Cosmos or generally in flash processing uh, for in DRAM processing or in memory processing, you kind of have to destroy the operands you read, but that's not the case for uh, in flash processing. You don't destroy the, the flash cells <laughs> or you have to re you don't have to reprogram them after doing operations on them i think that's neat uh and i really was impressed by the by their extensive device characterizations like how many devices they looked at and i think that that really shows how well thought this paper is then uh, a few things just on the paper itself I think the the way the paper is uh, kind of phrased and outlined, it's really a prime of example of this uh, engineering or science cycle we've seen in the first lecture, like where they analyze a problem, then they tackle the bottlenecks of that problem, and then they improve on the on that, and then yeah, I think that was quite neat. Then I think it was really well structured. For me, I never. I didn't even know what a, how a flash chip looked or works. And it was kind of doable reading the paper and getting the hang. Yes. And I think from all the papers I've read, this one made quite good use of their figures. It's, I often think if you, if you put figures into papers, you, you should, um, they, they should mean something and make a point and or an argument and I think that's that was really well done here. Now on to the weaknesses. Um, one of the I don't have really weaknesses or it's just yes. Uh, one is only quite simple algorithms are discussed in the paper like you do multi operand computation. And then you move the result to the CPU, but it and but there are algorithms who kind of are inherently need some sequential uh, operations that they're completely omitted in this work. Uh, another weakness is it, it it works only for SLC. It would and this kind of reduces the storage volume 
for example, if, if I'm a database operator and I want to use in flash processing, then I need bigger SSDs for the same database. Also, the system integration is a bit discussed in the paper, but it it feels like the this Flash Cosmos is more of a primitive and not a full system that could be used. It's like here is the primitive. We can do flash processing like this. Here is a, but it's not mature in any way, I guess. Um, then there are some open questions. They're a bit addressed in the in the paper, but not much. Uh, to do calculations in flash chips, you kind of have the problem that flash is often randomized, and you can't really operate on randomized data. The same goes goes for encrypted data. Um, you better have your SSDs and your laptops encrypted, uh, but you can do computation on encrypted data if you've heard of homomorphic encryptions and in the direction of this, but that's not there yet. And then there is the, this overhead of the, to improve the reliability, like the latency is a bit bigger from uh, incremental step repulse programming. Then I have two nitpicks from the paper, like the abstract is around the half a page. I think that's a bit too long. And on page three, they they list uh, how the read operations are done in a textual way. And I think such sequential events are usually better described as a list. So it's super clear which steps are kind of together. Yes. Are there any questions right now? Um, I have a question if you can hear me. Yes. Um, you have to speak loud, but I, I, I should get it. Um, you said in the last part that using flash cosmos um, does not require any changes to the uh, cell arrays. And yes. My, yeah, and my question is whether integrating uh, flash cosmos into current and uh, NAND flash numbers would require any changes to the interface of current flash numbers. Like how easy it is to uh, use to, to integrate this technology to current existing flash uh, memories. Um, to be honest, I am not that confident with flash. Mm. SSD architectures, um, like I don't think the flash chips itself need um, uh, major uh, changes in their interfaces, but I don't know if the SSD vendors kind of, if you get the information out of the SSD where your data is is really is, yes. Uh, just try to reduce the reduce. Uh, we have uh, this new one to change in the background and uh, it's a good uh, it's the because we use commands to enable such applications. So, uh, yeah, I mean, manufacturers can incorporate those changes. There are no changes to the search Is your question answered? Um, are there any other questions? Then I guess we will start with the discussion. Uh, for the discussion, at first I will be presenting a meme. And yes. And then you. Let's let's first have a look at it, and then I will ask some questions. So this is it. Um, can you see it? 
Yes, we can. Great. It's about the first question I have. I, I can't see the class, but I, I want you to, to, to raise your hand if you agree with the meme. Can you do that? And now the other group should raise your hand if you don't agree with the meme, if you think it's it's wrong or in, it's flawed. <laughs> okay, now now I can see you. <laughs> can we can we repeat it? Is is there anyone who kind of thinks this meme is flawed? Could you please raise your hand? Okay. Can I call you out and can you state why why you think it's it's not true? Yes. Is is there anyone else who kind of doesn't agree with the meme? You want to state something? No. Oh. <laughs> Weird looks. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> okay then let's continue to my next question uh, let's imagine you're kind of a, a master students and you want to do your own startup and you kind of ha have ex exclusively access to such non-existent in flash processing chips. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any other applications that would kind of heavily benefit from such a flash Cosmos system? Yes. Um, I think it almost all of like deep learning applications and neural net networks uh, would probably be sure to work because you, know, you, you have usually a vector of uh, uh, million or uh, hundreds of thousands of ways that uh, should be processed. And it is for sure a big push to be able to throw to operate on multiple trades. Uh, Yes. Is is there anyone else who has an idea? Okay. Then I have a, a last questions. Um, I hope. Uh, uh, it's about data movement. I mean. In flash processing doesn't have to be exclusively used. You can combine them together. Could you, can you think of applications kind of who would benefit from such a system that can do in flash processing, but can also in has in storage computing units? And yes, have you any idea kind of for applications that? Would benefit from a, such a heterogeneous system? Yes? I believe any operation which uses more than simple thing types of operations requires so much more dedicated logic. And ideally, it could be uh, done using in storage processing for like implementations of applications. Yes. I, I, I thought about the same things like you could do. Um, the end operation in the flash and then transfer your results to the in-storage computing units and then do there the bit counting or such more involved operations. Yes, 
Is there anyone else who wants to contribute something? Um, I have a question actually. Yes. Um, you said that using this flat cluster technology is uh, possible to perform either or or and a bridge. Yes. Could I portion it on the fourth line or on the um set on the block uh whether we're working on the word line scale or um on the block scale? And um, my question is is it actually possible to perform any kind of uh, arithmetic operations? Um, the the thing is, I omitted that in the presentation, but uh, flash chips usually have a, a functionality called reverse read, so you can all you can read the inverse of the data, and as you probably know, if you have and or and not, you can't have a, these. Um, I think they're called functional sets, but you kind of have to emulate then other operations, for example, in XOR. You can't do that natively in, in the flash. Uh, to that, like you probably would have to um, do an end, then store the page buffer back to the flash and do another end or to kind of build up your XOR gate. Yes. Are there any, there any other questions? Because I think time is running out. Then I thank you for your attendance. And I thanks a lot to my mentors, Rakesh and Mohamed. They supported me really well, even though I wasn't the best student. Yes. Thank you. Are there any comments? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I discussed a lot with Elias, and I think this is a very interesting direction that I would like to pursue personally. So, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to uh, increase the complexity of operations that we are going to be performing in the flash cosmos. As you say, we can try to perform arithmetic operations, uh, multiply and accumulate operations. Uh, uh, the operations that will accelerate machine learning operations, machine learning uh, workflows. So uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting work that can be done. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think uh, you gave a good overview. And uh, I definitely like the strengths and weaknesses you mentioned. There's certainly some issue that would be solved to make this truly generally applicable, right? And randomization, encryption, all of those are things that need to be solved. But this is something that's being examined today, where right? this has been set in the world for 20, 30 years. So there's a lot of baggage necessities that need to be resolved in the presence of this sort of computation. Um, and going back to your slide where you showed this cartoon, I think uh, I agree with the comments uh, that was made in the room. <laughs> These have different places, in my opinion, but certainly with large amounts of data, uh, you, you cannot fit everything in memory. Memory is clearly expensive. Uh, so in flash processing, it's good to have, but in memory processing, it's also good to have because the latency is all in memory processing is actually much, much lower, right? Uh, in flash, you have a latency problem. If you can tolerate the latency, that's good. But in the, you cannot get the memory latency, year latency that you have today in flash. So emerging memory technologies could be a good bridge between them, but they're not mature. None of them are anywhere close to flash or year end. So it's good to consider combining these, actually, I think, year end and flash. And certainly, an SSD, a storage system, is a very good place to do that. But you have more. Flash and the UN inside the storage system. So there's a lot of opportunity over here. So we'll see how the world evolves in the next period. But I think there's uh, the world become much more storage centric going into the future. Maybe it's easier that to, to make that memory centric. The storage is decoupled already as a system by itself.
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No. Okay. Then we should not delay any further. I think Mohammed has his regular reminder. You know what to do, I assume, right? Okay. Okay. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.